welcome to the hashtag Florida Virtual Field Trip. Today, we're visiting the UF IFAS Nature Coast Biological Station Discovery Center. Let's get started. Welcome to the UF IFAS Nature Coast Biological Station. Before we get into the Discovery Center, let's find out what this long name means exactly. NCBS, for short, is a University of Florida IFAS, or Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, research station. We are located in Cedar Key. Uh, because of that amazing location on the shore of the Nature Coast, students and biologists are able to conduct research in a hands-on field setting. Visitors and schools can also stop by the Discovery Center on the first floor and come face to face with some of the native animals in the area and learn about what our team is working on. That's what we're going to do today. Our first stop, our most important display, the Suwannee River Watershed Map. The Suwannee River Watershed covers approximately 9,950 square miles in South Georgia and North Florida. The watershed consists of the Suwannee River and all the creeks and streams which flow into the Suwannee as it makes its way into the Gulf of Mexico. Many species of fish and wildlife depend on the waters of the Suwannee River watershed. These rivers support many common species of fish and wildlife such as deer, raccoons, fox, egrets, and herons. These waters also provide habitat for species that are no longer very common. Species of concern include anadromous fish, such as the threatened gulf sturgeon. Anadromous fish depend on the Suwannee to migrate up the river from the gulf to spawn, whereas kadramous fish travel down the river to the gulf to spawn. Another uh, species is the endangered West Indian manatee. They also use the river and the lower Suwannee for summer birthing, and the, they prefer to mate in the Gulf of Mexico. Another species that depends on the river is the rare alligator snapping turtle, which whom we'll meet shortly. Another native species that depends on the relationship of the Suwannee River and the Gulf of Mexico is the clam. Many coastal communities depend on commercial fisheries and shellfish aquaculture. Hard clams are grown on estuarine or coastal submerged lands that are leased from the state of Florida. Hard clams are bivalves, which is a two hinged shell that filter feed using their gills on the inside to capture particulate foods such as phytoplankton from the water. Clams can even filter up to 4.5 gallons per day. So, successful clam farming requires good water quality, free of bacteriological and industrial contamination. Here, we have a display depicting three consecutive biological or cultural stages of clam farming. First, we have hatchery, which is the production of small seed. This is done in a lab setting out of the water. Now you can see they're very tiny in the small mesh bag. The second stage, nursery. These are slightly bigger. This is when we rear the larger seed in a water-powered raceway that provides protection from predators and a more controlled environment for growth. And the third and final stage, the big guys. This is the grow out. So the grow out is moving the nursery seed into the open water uh, lease to grow to a marketable size for selling. So then these clams will be sold and distributed across the nation to grocery stores, restaurants, families like you to enjoy. And as I mentioned earlier, here is the alligator snapping turtle. Wilbur here is actually a Swanee alligator snapping turtle, but like all snapping turtles, he has a rough brown shell, a large triangular head, a hooked beak, 
and a tail nearly as long as his body. These reptiles can grow up to two and a half feet long and weigh more than 200 pounds. They can also average about 50 years old. What do alligator snapping turtles do when they get hungry? They go fishing. They lure fish into their mouth, wiggling their tongue, which has a special attachment shaped like a worm. When fish are fooled and they come closer, they wind up as the turtle's next meal. Besides fish, alligator snapping turtles will also eat other turtles, snakes, snails, worms, clams, crayfish, and aquatic plants. That's quite a menu. What makes the alligator snapping turtle differ from the other common snapping turtle species? Well, they show minor morphological differences or physical adaptations in their skull, beak, and neck. And they are also genetically distinguishable, meaning that they are completely un unique to the Suwannee River. Now to me, one of our most friendly native species, the diamondback terrapin. Diamondback terrapin are most common in salt marshes, shallow bays, and tidal pools. They're usually found in brackish water, the mixture of salt water and crushed water. Male diamondback terrapins, like this one, are typically smaller than females, but both genders have unique diamond-shaped rings along the carapace, or shell, and they have distinct black and white markings along their face and the rest of their body. One biological advantage that this species has acquired over time is the ability to survive in salty water. Like sea turtles, they possess sweat glands in their eyes, allowing them to secrete excess salt from their blood. Last but not least, the large tank in the middle of the Discovery Center holds some of the Gulf's most popular sport fish. Here we have the red drum, the cobia, and the snook. These species are most sought after, and there are many regulations on the size and the amount that an individual can catch when fishing. This is why biologists are constantly researching the factors of fisheries management to better protect the population of these species for future generations to enjoy. And that's why it's important to teach all of you as well. Thanks for joining us.